Good afternoon, everyone. I did see that we're supposed to be in the 50s this week. So I'm excited I'm not going to freeze when I'm running now. I've been struggling to keep track of my hat and gloves the past couple of weeks. Uh, Margo keeps stealing them, and I don't know where they end up. So, so hopefully I won't freeze. Um, I did have one additional announcement to add in that I didn't have a chance to get into the bulletin, just so everybody's aware. It will be in next week. Um, we are working to set up a photo booth on the social on the 15th. So if anybody wants to update their photo for the directory, because it was partially our fault for the extension of the directory, once they realized we were coming, I know it kind of put everything on hold. So we're going to try, if you'd like to update your photos, we're going to try to get the backdrop and get a photo uh, place set up so that people can actually update their photos for the directory, because I know some of those are a little outdated as well. Everyone has a preference of where they like to live. You know, it, it may be closer to the city, maybe you work downtown, maybe you prefer more of the pe peace and quiet of the country, and you like to get away from all the, the hustle and bustle, or maybe you like to get somewhere in between so that you can take advantage of both, get to the city when you need to, or get back when you don't. Personally, I'm, I'm a city or a country guy. I, I like my peace and quiet, listening to the crickets and seeing the stars. It has something to do with my background. When I was 10, my parents and my grandparents were both looking for new houses. They, they decided to move. And so what they did, they, they started looking. And they looked for weeks and weeks. They were struggling to find anything. And then finally, something popped up. They, they knew... They knew of this place a little bit. It was about 45 minutes outside on um, the east side of Cincinnati. And so they, they went out to look at it. And as soon as they pulled onto the driveway, my grandmother goes, this is it. We found it. It ended up there. There was a house with 20 acres. And that's what they ended up deciding on. So they, they picked this lot. And what they did, they kept 10 for them. And then they split the other 10 between my mom and dad and my uncle and his wife. And so they each have lots. And so with my parents' section, my dad built a house there, and that's where I, I grew up. That was where I spent the rest of my life. So to give you a little bit of the setting of what this looks like, if, you, if you're standing on the street, on the road, and you're looking down our driveway, it's a long hill that dips way down at the very bottom. There's a creek that runs through as the, the driveway goes over top of this creek. And it, it ends up coming back up, and once you get to the top of this gravel driveway, there's, there's a fork in it. If you go right, you go to my grandparents' house. To the left is my parents' house. And the whole thing is wooded all the way up to the houses. We've got some areas right around the houses that are grass. But then from the, the, their back, it's all wooded. And we, we cut some, some paths through there so we can run our four-wheelers and our dirt bikes. We've got deer stands set up back there. Uh, we'd play paintball around the area. So we had, we had plenty of woods to run around and just be kids and so that's what I enjoyed. If you go all the way to the very back of the property, right as you get across our property line, it opens up into farmland. And there's a, a couple hundred acres of farmland that took up the entire back of our property and one whole side of it. So that left basically no houses. And in the dead of winter, when there's nothing on the trees, no snow, no leaves, you could see one house from my house. And it was a little bit off in the distance. So that's what I grew up with. That's, that's what I enjoyed. I like my privacy. Since then, we haven't been able to live anywhere like that. <laughs> but that's where I'd like to be. Some, someday in the future, that's where I'd, I'd like to get back to. And, and that's what I enjoy. So no matter what your preference is, whether you, you like the city or you like country, imagine the United States. What, what we know is the United States now. If we think back to, to 1800, at that point of time, most of the United States hadn't been acquired. It hadn't been settled. Everything west of the Mississippi was still basically unclaimed territory. So picture yourself. If you had an opportunity to go and find your perfect spot, the perfect place that whether you wanted to start a first city or whether you wanted that peace and quiet of nothing but your family, you get to go and you had first rights to claim land. You're looking and you think about what it is that that you would want out of your land. What, what place would be perfect? And you're looking, and you finally get out there, and you're looking around. You're finding what fits all your criteria, what you're looking for. 
There's only one problem. The spot where you could build your house, there's a mountain there. It's perfect except for that. We don't want to build our house on the side of the mountain in the cliffs. So, so what do we do? What, what, what do we have? Because of our faith, we have, we have something, though. We have a way of remedying that. If you flip over to Matthew 21, we have a solution that we can find in Matthew 21 that we can fix where we want to put our house. Matthew chapter 21, if you look at verses 21 and 22, here we find the story where Christ caused a fig tree to wither. And the disciples are trying to figure out how it happened so quick because normally things don't just up and die and shrivel up and they're gone. It's a process of them slowly dying. And this is what, what we see from his answer here. Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 21, says, So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Ha! Ah, problem solved. God gives us whatever we want. That's what it says, isn't it? That's all we have to do. We have to ask in faith. Or is that really what this means? Is that what Christ is talking about? That we can have him move a mountain so we can put our home, put the, where we want to establish our family. It's a funny way of addressing this, but today I want to go over a couple points. I've got some keys to answered prayers. Keys to answered prayers. So point number one. We have to know the will of God. Know the will of God. And this is critical. This is a critical point because it goes along with everything that God expects out of us. The expectations that he sets on us. Because without knowing what he wants for us, where are we going? We're not sure where our life is taking us. We're not sure what we're doing with our life. Well, oftentimes, we don't even know why we exist. We don't know what the purpose of us being here on earth is. That's one of the greatest things about understanding the truth, is knowing why we are here, knowing what is expected of us, and where, we're, where God's leading us, what we're getting to. No matter how hard we look in the Bible, we're not, we're not going to open up the Bible and find a header that says, Joshua Creech. We can't go in here and find that. And then it gives us some details of, I exp- this, is what, this is what the details of what God wants for me. I want you to marry Elizabeth and who you're going to have four kids with. I want you to go to school to be an accountant. I want you to do that for about ten years, and I want you to give it all up and serve my people as a minister. <laughs> it would have been nice to have that heads up. That, that, would have, that would have been beneficial from my mental aspect of this, maybe more so for my wife, but that would have been helpful. But that's not what God gives us. No matter how hard we dig around, we're not going to find that. None of our names are in this instruction manual that he gives us. This guide to how we live our life. And it's because he doesn't want to control every aspect of our lives. He doesn't want to manipulate every piece of what makes us who we are. We have to learn. We have to grow. We have to use this as an instruction manual. We have to use that as a guiding light. He doesn't tell us where to live who to marry, what jobs to take, how many kids to have. Those aren't things that he he expects. He doesn't have it pinpointed down to all these specific details. But he does have a plan. He's got a plan and he has a purpose for what we're doing and where we're going. If we look at Christ as our example, even he put an exuberant amount into this point number one. Of knowing God's will. If you flip back to Matthew chapter 6. We're given an outline for how we're supposed to lay out our prayers. And we know that this isn't some repetitious thing that we're just supposed to repeat over and over again. But this is an outline. This is a structure that we can use when we're thinking about our prayers. When we're on our hands and knees praying to God and and talking to him. Because that's that's our opportunity to talk to God. This This is God talking to us. 
Our prayers are when we get to talk to him. We get to explain what's going on in our lives. And so we see this outline here. If you look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, it says, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God's will is for us to grow, for us to change our attitude, for us to change our character. That's more in line with what Jesus Christ did established. He was that example for us. He wants us to grow spiritually to a point that we understand, we realize that we need his Holy Spirit. That we understand that without his Holy Spirit, we are nothing. We have no chance to overcome this world without that. And that through baptism, we're able to receive that. We can receive that gift from him. And it also includes a future focus. It includes a future focus of all humanity. All mankind being given an opportunity to join God's family. For all of us to become brothers and sisters. And these two pieces, these two aspects of his will and his plan, they walk hand in hand. It shows us where we're going. What he expects of us. And for us to be part of that plan, we must actively be doing his will. We must actively be working towards that. If you would, turn over with me to to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 50. We see the importance of family. Mr. Pacelli talked about taking advantage of, of all that time we have with family. Not taking for granted or looking back and wishing that we had done more with our family. We, we see an explanation here. We see how prioritized it is with God. If you look at Matthew chapter 12, and then verse 50, and Christ makes a special point to clarify who his family is. Here he says, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. For whoever does the will of my Father That is family. And that's what we're doing. We're working together. We're all working in the same direction. Some of us have been baptized, some haven't yet. Some are still working towards that. We're part of this family, this unit that we grow and develop. It's like our children. Our children don't understand all of the details, all of the rules, all the laws of the land that we live in. We teach them that. We're not only teaching them God's laws, but we're teaching them how to live in society. Live within the confines of understanding what it is that God wants of us. And how how we should act. How we should treat people. This is a critical component of understanding God's will. Knowing what we need to do. Knowing that it's essential for our future. And knowing that it's essential for actually putting into our prayer life. Understanding that if we don't understand his will then we're not understanding why we're even praying to him. Why we're coming to him with all of our concerns, with our wants, our needs, our requests to help others. We don't see the end result of what we're doing, why we're living in this life. All of God's laws, all of his rules that he has made for us, they're they're established to help us. They're established to guide us. They're for our benefit. They help us. For us to stay on track. They're not for God. They weren't designed for God. That's why in the Bible we can see that God takes life at times. He's not under the confines of the rules that he gave to us. He gave them to us for benefit. He gave them to us because they're the expression of his will. The laws are the expression of God's will and what he wants us to do. Not what he wants for him. He doesn't have to worry about making idols for himself. We're the ones that happen to do that. Humanity is the one that falls under that. He doesn't put anybody above himself. Like I said, he's the one that gets to take life because he gives life. 
He's above those. They're designed for us. They're the expression of his will for us, for where we're going in life. When you think about King David, King David did a lot of things right, but he did a lot of things wrong. We know he wasn't perfect by any means, but we can look through the Bible and we can see where he, his heart was genuinely geared towards what God wanted. Even though he failed and slipped up multiple times, he, he knew at the end what he wanted with his life. That it was God. He had to put that first. If you flip back to Psalm 40, we can take a look at this understanding that he had. Psalm chapter 40. Psalm 40. If we pick it up in verse 6, Psalm 40, verse 6, it says, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burn offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written with, written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is within my heart. That was his delight, to do God's will. And he said, it's in my heart. You've put it inside of me, and that's what I want to do. This is what we have to strive for. This is what we're working towards. We have to have the same mentality, the same lifestyle. We have to study the commands that God's given us. We have to gauge where we are spiritually. See how we're measuring up. Because at times we're doing a, we're, we do a good job at times. But there's other times where we struggle. A lot of times with that, our prayer life struggles. We see how all of this is interconnected. It's intertwined. But we want, his, we want his lifestyle to be embedded in us. We want his laws to be inside of our hearts. If you take a look at Matthew chapter 23, this gives us a little bit of depth, a little nugget of exactly what this is meaning. Matthew chapter 23 If we pick it up in verse 23, here Christ is getting on some of the religious leaders, helping to open their eyes at their lack of understanding of what what the laws really are and, and the implementation that comes with that. And so we see this depth that's involved with God's laws. It's not as cut and dry as, as sometimes we think it is. And that's where we pick it up here in Matthew chapter 23. Starting in verse 23, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup, and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. They were so worried about these physical components, these physical things that they were doing. It sounds funny us to talk about straining out a gnat, or swallowing a gnat, swallowing the camel, when you're trying to strain out the gnat. But it had a much bigger impact for them. Because what they actually did, they actually strained their water. Before they drank out of a cup, they would strain the water because they didn't want to fall and break one of the commandments by swallowing a gnat because they're unclean. But Christ is saying, you're worried about this little tiny speck of of a bug when you guys are swallowing a camel. It's unclean too. And for us, we understand there's a much greater impact spiritually for our lives. And what it means for how we have to change who we are. How we have to work and striving to actually not only know his law. Not only know it written, but know what it means when we apply it to our lives. And how it changes who we are. Knowing his will. And approving the things that are actually good for us. That are beneficial. You don't have to go over there, but Romans 2 verse 18. It says, and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. That's what guide us, guides us to something better. 
His laws are designed to help us, to help us shed light on a world where all humanity struggles with sin. It helps to keep us right with God, truly good. And Paul shows some aspects, some additional things to this. If you flip back to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, right in the very beginning. If we pick it up in verses 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In verse 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is good and that uh, what is good that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He wills us to be a sacrifice. That's in, that's part of what He wants from us. Who He wants us to become. This isn't the fact that we don't have to go and lay down our lives in death like Jesus Christ did. That's not what He's expecting of us. We're supposed to be a living sacrifice, breathing, eating, sleeping playing, laughing. We have to be a living sacrifice. Every single day of our life, we become a sacrifice. Hopefully, we, every day we, we grow in that. We keep becoming more and more of a sacrifice. We lay aside our own desires, our own wants. We lay those things aside when we start rerouting too much energy away from our relationship with God. Too much energy or resources away from building a stronger relationship with God and his family. When we're putting all this time and energy and effort away from God's family, we're focused on the wrong things. God's not looking at us to, to make go from zero to a hundred. This is a He's given us a lifetime. He's given us a lifetime to work through this process. It's not a one-time event. For those who have been baptized, we understand more than anyone that it's at baptism we're not done. That's actually when the hard stuff begins. That's when the hardest part of being a child of God begins, is after baptism. Building up to that and understanding what that commitment is, we, we can think we understand it. But it's not until our actual life is on the line and we've committed our life to God saying, I'm going to live your way no matter what. Whether it means I have to give up a job, whether it means who knows what, giving up football games on Friday. As teens, you guys have it rough. You become a spectacle. We all deal with the different aspects of having to give things up. But it's something God expects. There's a, there's a transformation, a process of changing our minds where at some point, hopefully it gets easier over time because we are becoming that living sacrifice. And we, with God's help, he leads us down a path and eases us into this transition period of knowing that this life is temporary. And most of all, that we put obeying him above everything else. There's nothing that's going to break that. And God's ultimate will is... For all of us to become part of his family. That's what it is. We all become part of his family. The aspects that we previously mentioned of working through this and building up our character and our attitude that aligns with his will, his understanding. Because when we know his will, we're able to construct our prayers in a different manner. We're able to see where, where the focus really should be. It helps us to realign what our prayers are when we know his will. So that brings us to point two. Point number two is ask in faith. Ask in faith. If you turn with me over to James chapter one, we'll start here. This section begins by talking about trials, using trials for our for our benefit, for edification. James chapter one. If you look at verses 5 through 8, it says, 
If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We have to have the faith. We have to understand that without, without God, nothing gets accomplished. This not having any doubt is not a light statement. Because as humans, it's hard to wrap our minds around some of the things that God can accomplish. Especially when we're asking for certain things. Because I know I've, I've in the past done it. Pray for somebody to be healed. All the time, we have so many prayer requests. And we just think about how much they're suffering. We ask for these different things of him. Sometimes it's more personal. It's, it's something that helps us. But as, as our mind, as we start analyzing and processing this, sometimes we try to zero in we, we, or we pinpoint the how. How is God going to do this? When we think about healing people, it's, all right, God, are you, you going to actually just heal this person? Are you going to give the doctors the wisdom to figure out what's going on, who they need help? Are you going to help guide them to the doctor they need to get in touch with? We start analyzing everything about this, and we lose an aspect of this, this faith. Because as humans, we, we, have to, we have to line everything up and try to figure out how it's working, how God's going to make it happen. Whether or not I'm fully 100% vested that I have the faith that I know God's going to answer this. How do I know it's not just happenstance? Because some things do work out. We have all these, these questions that just rattle around sometimes in our head. And, and it distracts us. It distracts us from the faith aspect. We try to work our faith up to the point of where we can understand what God's going to do or how he's going to do it. And we get, once we get all those pieces lined up, then it makes sense to us. But everything that God does doesn't necessarily make sense. Because he's working on his time frame. He's working out his plan. Now that's what we have to be aware of. That we don't have to understand how it happens. We just have to understand that he can do it. God is the object of our faith. Not faith. God is the object of our faith. Faith is not the object. And we have to do it. We have to work to try to understand this. We find ourselves in some trouble. If we're saying one of two things when we don't have faith. One, we're either saying God can't answer it, or God, He won't answer it. So if we think about if God can't answer it, we, we find ourselves in a very precarious situation. If we think that God can't do something or can't fix something, we're questioning His sovereignty. We're questioning His authority of what He's capable of. His power. If we think he won't, we're not in that much better shape. It's not that much better to think God won't do something. Because at that point, we're questioning his goodness. Questioning his mercy. We're questioning his love. God loves to see us do well. He wants to help us. So to pray in faith means that we believe that he can and that at the right time, he will work something out. But it's in his time frame. It's, in, it's when it's consistent with his plan and what he's doing. Because God is good. That's his nature. God is just good. We see a pattern of this through the scriptures. You don't have to turn to all, all these. But we look at just a couple of the psalm. Psalm 107.1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Psalm 119.68 says, You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Going back to that hand in hand, that the good and the law, they blend together. Psalm 145.9 says, The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. We have to have the faith in our prayers that he's good. No matter what the outcome is, no matter whether we get the answer that we were expecting or not, 
He is working something out for good. Go back to Nahum, the book of Nahum. We don't turn to this too often. But if you look at Nahum chapter 1, this hits on the same aspect. Nahum chapter 1, if we pick it up in verse 6, we read 6 through 8. It says, Who can stand before his indignation? And who can endure his fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. But with an overflowing flood... He will make an utter end of its place, and darkness will pursue his enemies. We have to have the faith that he is our stronghold. No matter what we're facing, what we're going through, he is the supplier of all of our needs. He's the one that is there. He expects us to have the faith when we go to him in prayer to understand that it's going to work out because he's hearing us. We have to have the faith that his judgment is what's going to be needed for that time. Whether we think it's the right one or not. Because we know that we believe in his love, his love, how much he cares. We believe that he is doing the best for us. Not us as individuals, but us as a family. Because some answers are, aren't just for us. It impacts more than just us. We might think something is only for us, but we don't realize the bigger impact that we can have at times. So we have to realize that his decision and his answer is the one that we needed. We have to work on that. If we look around the world today, there's millions of people out there who live good lives. They're, They're doing well. But God gives us the best life. God gives us the best opportunity to, to succeed. That's some, and that's why sometimes he says yes, no, and sometimes it's not now. Those are sometimes the hardest ones. When we don't think we get an answer. We just have to wait. We have to be patient and wait a little bit longer. So don't get caught up reasoning why God can't answer questions when we're praying, when we're asking for his involvement in our lives or ask for something specific. If we need a vehicle repaired, if one of our cars break down, if we're short on rent or the electric bill, we need some food, we need water. Don't worry about the how. I've seen too many examples of how God works things out. Because it's easier for us to think, oh, God can't just make my $5 bill multiply 100 times. Because it's easy for us to get into that mindset and try to rationalize the the physical component of actually getting those things paid. We have to worry about his judgment, the decision that he decides on. There was another minister who told me a story a little while back, and he was talking about when he was in college. At the point in time he was married, he had a baby. He was working on his doctorate degree, and at the same time, his wife was working to finish up college, too, and get her degree. So they're they're going through school. They've already had the beginnings of their family started. And he said he was doing everything that he possibly could to make ends meet. He was working three different jobs just to try to make enough to pay the rent. He said it ended up that he fell short. He said even though he was busting his butt, he said it wasn't enough. They they weren't going to be able to pay the rent one month. They're, from his standpoint, he didn't know what to do. He was struggling because he's trying to be a good husband and a good father, provide for his family. But he was tapped out. There, there really physically wasn't anything else for him to do. I guess he could have gotten three more jobs, but at some point we don't have time. We, we don't, there aren't enough hours. And he was at that point. He said it took him a while before he realized that he just needed to break down and give it over to God. He was doing so much by himself that he neglected to think about, okay, where, where am I, who am I giving this to? And so once he broke down and ended up realizing that he needed help, he prayed. 
He talked to God about needing the help. He said it, it wasn't a, but another day or two. He received a letter in the mail. He said he, he opened the letter. It was from a family member, and there was a check that covered rent for that month. He, he never talked to any of the family about needing help. He never talked to anybody about being short. And he knows that for some reason God moved them inside their hearts to decide to send money at that specific time to help them out. So God can work things out that we have no idea what's in play. We have no idea what's, it go- what's going on in his big plan, his scheme. But sometimes it takes for us to break ourselves down and realize that it, it's a reliance on him. That we need him. Without him, we have nothing. That that's where the benefits come from. God's aware of our motives when we pray. He enjoys us because that's us talking to him. Talking to him about his lives. And at times I've struggled to pray. To make it just a real conversation. Because that's what it is. A lot of times our prayers are our conversation with our father. And it's hard when he's not talking back. We think we aren't, in our heads, we, we don't think we're being heard. But if we sincerely at opening ourselves up, it's pleasing to him. He loves to hear what's going on in our lives. It's a delight to hear. And he responds according to his judgment, according to how what we need at that time. And he's going to make the best decision for our lives. The best decision for our lives and all of those who are involved. I mentioned that sometimes we don't realize the bigger play. With us just moving more recently, how many of you have heard of the butterfly effect? Quite a few. So for those who haven't heard, butterfly effect is the impact that we make, kind of the ripple. If you you throw a rock in a water, you see these rings. The rings start forming. So that initial impact was the point where the water was disturbed, but it had an effect on a much larger ring. That's what we do as people. With us just buying a home, it, we get caught up and say, okay, I think this is the house. And we pray and pray, God, let us get this house, let us get this house. This worked perfectly for us. The problem is, if I get that house, there's somebody else who can't have that house. And God may know that there's somebody else who needs that house more than I do. Or that it would work out better for somebody else. So I always try to remember that. That there's a butterfly effect that we have. Every answer that we receive has an impact on a much greater scale than what we realize, what we notice sometimes. So after asking faith, point number three. Point number three is ask in Christ's name. Ask in Christ's name. Now, this one may seem automatic. Hopefully, to some extent, it should be. But at the same time, we have to be really careful that we we don't get into this habitual state of just tagging that on to the end of our prayers. Because that that can become a big problem. If we forget what it truly means to ask in Jesus Christ's name. Because that's how we close all of our prayers. If you would, turn back to John chapter 16 with me. It kind of gets back to where we started today about being able to ask God for anything. John chapter 16. If you pick it up in verse 23. John 16 verse 23. It says, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. So it is through Jesus Christ that we're able to approach our Father, that we can ask for anything. That's our focus. That's part of that outline that we read earlier of our prayers. When we add those words in Jesus Christ's name, are we really focusing on the magnitude of what we're saying? Do we understand what that means? 
Because when we do that, we're actually essentially saying that this is a prayer from Jesus Christ. That this is Christ saying this. That my prayer is aligned with what Christ would say. That he's approving our prayer. And he's going before the Father. You know, this happens to be a presidential election year. Whether it's a presidential election or not, every time we come around these, these different uh, election cycles, we begin seeing these ads that always pop up. We're just inundated with them. It's sickening to watch TV at times, just because you see so many of them. But we get these ads where we have these candidates explaining who they are, they're explaining what they're going to do for us or what they're going to change, how they're going to change it. And then at the very end of going through this list, they say, I'm so-and-so and I approve this message. What does that mean? They're saying everything that was in that ad, they're validating. That that's coming from them, that they trust in that. That's what we're doing with Christ. That's what we're asking of Christ. Is that he say, this prayer that we're giving, he can stand behind 100%. That he's going to stand behind it. And what we're asking is in line with everything that he would believe in, that he would ask for. We must be certain that we're not stepping over those bounds. That we're not asking for things that he would never ask of God. Something that's against God's will. We're not going to find that of Christ. Christ isn't going to break God's will. He's not going to focus solely on himself. He's not going to only ask for selfish requests. And that's the hard one. That, that's one that we, we struggle with. Because there's times that we do need things. That we, we do need help. We, need, we ask we don't necessarily need them. We would like something. And it's okay. We see from Christ's example, that's okay. If you would, turn back to Mark chapter 14 with me. There's an extent where it's not just being selfish when we ask for things. But we have to be careful that we're not breaking that. If you look at Mark chapter 14... And then verse 35, we see that this isn't a selfish request. This is when Jesus is praying in Gethsemane. We see this outpouring of his, his inner thinking. Of this, He's broken down at this point. And we see this emotional prayer that he says. If you look at Mark 14, verse 35... He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. This was a very personal request. If God had removed the, him as the sacrifice. It would have helped him. Because he knew the pain. He knew the agony that he was about to endure. He knew the suffering that he was going to be facing very shortly. And he asked God, if there's any other way, if I don't have to do this, I would really appreciate it. But it goes back to that bigger picture. Without that sacrifice, none of us have a chance. And God was willing to give up his son to build a larger family. No matter how much pain Christ had to go through, God understood that there was a more important part of his plan, of his will that had to take place. And there's sometimes we're going through trials where we think it's just too tough. In the midst of it, it feels too tough. And we're going through, but God never, never gives up on us. And God always sees us through. God puts people in our lives to help get us through those points. So we need to check. Do we always pray according to the Father's will? Is that part of what we're doing? Are we focused on 
the outcome? Are we focused on the answer that we get? Or are we focused on understanding exactly what it was that Christ represented, the life that Christ lived? We see that we can pray for anything. We can pray for what we need. But if we really think about it, we don't want to pray for everything. We don't want to pray for anything that we want. We want to try to make sure it falls within the guidelines of what Christ would ask for, of what he, would, he is, the life that he lived, why he was here, why he lived and died. Because he sees that bigger picture too. He understands exactly the outcome, the benefits for all of us. He understands when something's going to benefit others more than it's going to benefit us. We have to remember that. Take a look at John chapter 14 with me. It's important that we always keep in perspective context of what we read through the Bible. Because people like to cherry pick individual things. They could take some of these one or two scriptures and be able to to make it sound like God doesn't exist, that God doesn't care about us, or he doesn't hold up to his promises, and therefore he doesn't exist. If he's not keeping his promises, he doesn't exist. So if we look at John chapter 14, if we look at verses 13 and 14, I've actually had people throw this in my face before and try to use this as an explanation. But it falls in line with what we're going over today. He says in verse 13, it says, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I've had people say, well, God says we can ask for anything, and he's going to give it to us. And they'll show a scripture like this. We've read a couple of them today where it looks like that. But if we don't read in context, we're missing big chunks. For this one, they're not all this simple. Sometimes we have to read entire sections, which is 10, 15 verses, Here, all we have to do is back up one verse to understand the extent of what Christ is talking about. So let's read through this again. But we're going to pick up verse 12 this time. And look at the words of of what this is geared around. It says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. It's geared around the will of God. Christ says, I did, I'm doing God's will. If you do it, you'll do greater works than me. And that I'm going to help you. We're not left by ourselves. He says, I'm going to help you. I'm going to get you through there. So we have to be careful when we read. We have to understand in context what's going on because we want to be like Christ. We want to live his life. Our actions want to be the same actions as him. As we go and ask and we pray, we need to make sure that these are things that he would ask. That when we ask it in Christ's name, it is aligning with something that he would ask. Point number four, make sure our life remains right. Point number four, make sure our life remains right. One of the major aspects of genuine heartfelt repentance. That's what this is. Repentance. Making sure our life remains right. And this is something that is a must before baptism. Until we understand what repentance is, we can't be baptized. If we don't ever think we're wrong, there's no reason to be baptized or repent. If we don't think we mess up. So it's critical for us to understand what it means to live a right life. To make sure that we're, we're on the right track. Understand that we are all sinners. In Luke 5, verse 32, he states, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So all of us that he's begun to show us the truth, congratulations, you're sinners. 
But that's not what we stand on, is it? We stand on that repentant part. We stand on the fact that, hey, I'm trying to change. When we break this down, that's what repentance is in its basic form. It means to change. We have to change the way we think. We're changing our minds. We're changing our hearts. We change our behavior. We change the path that we're on. We change our priorities. And it changes our life. It opens us up to a whole different world. God expects us to demonstrate that change. That's what repentance is. Understanding that who we are now isn't who we want to be. That's who, not who we're going to be. That old life that we lived, we buried it. At baptism, we buried it and it no longer exists. That's why we don't think about it anymore. That's why we don't have to harbor those mistakes that we made beforehand. Because they were completely washed away. God has given us a way to become right. A way to get back on the right path. And it's through understanding his laws. Understanding his commandments. That's what helps us to live this right life. To soften our hearts. Because... We can talk all day about understanding or knowing the laws. We can talk to people about them. We can profess to know them. But that doesn't cut it. If we explain somebody and, and lay it out piece by piece what all the laws are, we can stand there and talk to them all day. But if we don't actually live it, that has a much bigger impact on them than us being able to tell them exactly what God's laws are, what he's expecting of us. If we're not applying it and realigning our own lives, they're not going to understand it. They're not going to not going to understand that there's a difference. If you flip back to Titus chapter one, Paul Paul's writing to the Cretans here about some errors that are being taught. Titus chapter one. We're only going to look at the very last verse. Titus 1, verse 16. It says, They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Any type of good that they did do, they were disqualified for. Because their life wasn't aligned. They didn't make sure their life remained right. They had errors or flaws. We can't only use our words to try to obey God. We must live as Christ did. We have to change who we are. The Bible oftentimes uses the word walk. It talks about this walk that we're on. It refers to our lifestyle. That's what it is. This life that we live. This living sacrifice that we're becoming. The day in and day out of what we do. Do we simply know God's words or are we actually applying them to our life, putting them into action? Do our coworkers, do our friends, family, do they see a difference? Do they see a difference in us? It's what, often what times what we have to ask ourselves. Because when we obey the commandments, we're living that life that Christ did. We're following his footsteps. We're imitating his example. We're working towards keeping our life right, making sure we're right, being obedient. If we think about today, we we came together on the Sabbath. This is God's Sabbath day. We come together. He gives us an entire day to focus on him, to to try to set aside for him, not focus on our own things, but focus on his word, draw closer to him. He gives us extra time. Some of that's extra time to sleep in the morning, which is nice. But hopefully we we are making sure that we're putting the priorities in line and that it does focus on him, that we're drawing closer to this family. This family that he's pulled together, that's that's our goal. That's our goal. We make an attempt every week to get here. And it's hard because sometimes we feel a little under the weather, but we know we're gonna infect somebody else, but we don't feel bad enough that we wanna stay home. It's better that we stay home because we love to be together. 
We love to be here with God's people. We're taken away from the distractions of the week. And we get to focus on God. We draw closer. We take advantage of this time that God has set aside. Because during the week, it's tough. Well, we're, we've got busy lives now. Oftentimes, there's a lot of distance that separates us. So it's not as easy to get together during the week. But God put, to, put aside this time for us to be joined together. Now, hopefully, most of our conversations are, are uplifting. They are, we are focused on God. Times of the year like this, yeah, Super Bowl is going to come up. But hopefully that doesn't dominate what we're doing. But we are focused on the spiritual matters. We check on each other, how, how your week went, how you're feeling. We know multiple people who got hit with the flu over the past couple of weeks. Checking to see, hey, how you doing? Do you need me to bring soup this week to you? We have this time where we're joined. God has promised to hear us. He promises to listen to our prayers. He wants to hear our prayers. He, he's expecting us to a, approach him in a godly manner with an attitude that's seeking and understanding that we want his will. We want his will to be done. We want him to guide and correct us. We want him to keep us on that path. Flip back to one last scripture. 1 Peter chapter 3. This is the final one we'll turn to today. 1 Peter chapter 3. If you look at verse 12, it says, mm, That's not what I'm looking for because I'm in 2 Peter. 1 Peter. 1 Peter 3 12. Says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. If we're not living a life that's aligned right, he's not going to listen to us. But he wants us to get on that path because he wants to hear us. He wants us to open up. It actually brings him joy. Revelation 5 8, it actually compares prayers to incense. The, the prayers of the saints he said, are like a sweet-smelling incense. I think about most of you have experienced some type of essential oils or one of those smells that just we really enjoy. That's what our prayers are to God. It's something that he desires to smell. He loves it. He wants to hear us. A sincere prayer is powerful. A sincere prayer is powerful, and he loves to hear it. He wants to answer it. We see multiple scriptures throughout the Bible that exhort us to pray. They encourage us to pray. And we also see some that give us guidelines or outlines, examples of how to pray, how we should approach him. So remember, when you pray, these four points of the will of God, ask in, ask in faith, ask in Christ's name, and make sure our life remains right.